from the succulent studios of Univest at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. It is time for another fresh eaten episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hijinks You Bet Your Garden. You may already be enjoying the first runs of your lettuce, but more solid fare is just around the corner. I'm Mike McGrath, and on today's show, we'll reveal the best timing for you to enjoy a June that's full of peas. Plus, your fabulous phone call questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and demonically delivered declarations. So stay right where you are, cats and kittens, because it's all coming up faster than you proudly picking your first snow peas at the end of May. Right after this. J.L. Hudson Seeds has supported You Bet Your Garden and enthusiastic growers for more than 25 years. To learn more about the world's most eclectic seed company, visit jlhudsonseeds.net. Welcome to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden. From the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, I am your host, Mike McGrath. Coming up later in the show, perhaps the most timely of timely articles we could tell you about at this time of year. We're going to tell you all the cheats and tricks for you to get the maximum number of, quote, June peas. Whether you're growing snow peas, snap peas, shelling peas, English peas, it doesn't matter. You got to get the timing right, and we'll get your timing right after some of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. Frank, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. How you doing? Oh, uh, I'm fine. Um, enjoying the uh, balmy weather in Oklahoma here. Okay. And uh, yeah. so are you in OKC? I am in the uh, in the... In the city, what used to be the suburbs, but the city grew. So, I live in the uh, uh, older part of the city, 1920s area. Oh, that must be and interesting. Garden here, yeah. All right. So we have a, a small lot in front and backyards, and uh, try and grow vegetables, um, flowers in well, flowers everywhere, but vegetables right now in our drive, in pots. We seem that's more successful than the square foot garden we used to try that just got neglected. It was too far away. The, 50, 60 foot walk to look after it was just too far. Mm-hmm. Need to take care of it properly. Yeah. That's and, that's the yeah. uh, reason behind quote kitchen gardens. You're supposed to be able to yes. walk out of your kitchen with a scissors, harvest what you need, and walk right back in. Yeah, and that's uh, well, it all. Our kitchen overlooks it, so it works that way. So, what can we do you for? Well, um. I, I heard of one of your shows the other day, and you were talking about rainwater, well, rainwater harvesting, and it's something that that uh, we've been doing for the last couple of years. And uh, I just one of the issues that was mentioned was about getting adequate pressure if you've just got water in a in the rainwater barrel, so you can water things and. Um, I've come up with a solution that I thought I might share with you um, that doesn't use any additional energy. It's a little solar-powered thing that uh, might uh, suit some of the listeners. So uh, I want to mention that uh, this is a topic that really does apply to your area. A lot of people here in the Northeast build rain barrels and sprinkler systems and stuff like that. And typically we have too much water in a given year, whereby Oklahoma is famous, uh, unfortunately, for your historic dust storms and long dry periods that just, oh, and windy, so it just wipes the soil away. That's right, yes. And uh, when it does rain, although we have a reasonably reliable uh, amount of uh, rainwater, some 30 or so inches, um, it tends to come in two big lumps. Um, and the rest of the time, it's hot, you know, it's it's, un, it's unpredictable that you can go for long periods between, which is why the, 
some sort of storage if you're going to use rainwater it is essential for it. That's the old line with yeah. one farmer talking to the other going, hey, we got a good rain yesterday. And the other farmer goes, would have been better last week. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, the way that, um, and so to, to try and tide us over, instead of using the 555 gallon typical drum or one or two of those, um, and you can pick these up cheaply, they are called IBCs, International Bulk Containers, I think it stands for. Um, the big cube, they're, they're a, a, a cubic meter, 275 gallons, okay. and you can get them food grade, and that's what we use. But the thing about it is it's a very heavy device. Well, 55 gallons is. Um, so to raise it to some decent height, where well, you'll always get you know enough pressure to push it through your hoses, that's a decent-sized structure you might, and it's not an attractive thing at all. What I uh, came up with is I bought a small a solar fountain pump you might put in your bird bath, a $15 device, and I put that in the big tank, and that slowly pumps up during the day into a, a smaller 30-gallon barrel that I sit on top of the tank and keeps it topped up so it becomes like a, I'd call it a day tank, so you've got enough water to see you through the day. And it's always at a consistent pressure because it's sitting at that sort of four feet off the ground doesn't need a big structure to hold it up and i thought that was uh and it's got a little overflow so once the tank is full it runs back to the main tank and and, for, and of course yeah. from your barrel you can then run tubing um to your raised beds or ornamentals you can fill up watering cans however you want to take it from there but at four feet off the ground, you've got gravity on your side. The water's going to flow. All you have to do is aim the hose and turn on the spigot. Exactly, exactly. It's surprising. You wouldn't think there was much pressure uh, developed from that, but just that too. Well, you find out when you disconnect the hose without turning the water off, when you try and screw it back on, even <laughs> with three or four feet of pressure behind it, you can get quite wet. So, yeah, so it does everything we need for our front and back. Yeah, and, we've got a lot that's about 150 feet long. And I can't believe that the engine of your device is a, a, a basically a birdbath fountain. Uh, as you said, a $15 yeah. a device at which probably came with a little solar panel. And it uh, moves the water around enough inside the big tank to actually push it up into the the barrel that's much higher. Yes, yeah. They, they will only move about, two, I think probably that's the limit of it, about three or four feet, but it's enough because uh, with the barrel, and we have the barrel on its side, um, it's a very consistent pressure. So even when the, it's a 30-gallon tank, starts to go empty, you're still getting nearly, you know, over three feet of head. And when it's full, it's four feet. So uh, it's a problem if you've got the things uh, a deep tank when you reach the bottom of it you can be running out of pressure but it's elevating the whole thing like that um gives you a consistent pressure one thing we haven't covered how does the water get into the main tank the square tank we take um we've got a garage apartment here it's a, a double garage type roof area and i just take the water off that it's about 600 square feet of roof and it will fill that 275 gallon tank with three quarters of an inch of rain, which in Oklahoma can be about 10 minutes. So <laughs> yeah. Startling. Uh, uh, it's just uh, it's so exciting to see it fill up for the first time in, in an hour and then. Um, so I filter it through, um, it's an old um, uh, fly screen, that's for window. And um, I've got little arrangements so that when it's full, it overflows off to the side to 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 where the water would have gone before we put the the tank in the way if, 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 if it sits in your garden you wouldn't need to do that you could just let it overflow onto where it was going to go but it, it will overflow quite quickly well i mean you have given people in dry climes um some real valuable things to think about and as you know um and as we all know the weather is changing so constantly um 
you we just had massive floods here in Pennsylvania, um, but surrounded by dry stretches. And I realize it's not the ideal growing time of the year in the Northeast, but we often uh, do have um, several weeks in the summer where we don't get adequate rain. And, of course, the summertime, uh, the plants need more water than they do when they're dormant. So I think this could apply to everybody. I think you've described it perfectly. And um, and you cut down on your water bill, too, I'll bet you. Oh, it's very fascinating. We, it never, we didn't use any. That one tank saws all the way through the summer, the growing season. Our water usage on our bill was flat. It was the same winter and summer, so I felt very smug. I couldn't have been more smug if we had two hybrid cars. <laughs> All right, Frank. Well, thank you for your ideas. Um, our gardeners in dry climes have been listening with ears growing to twice their size. And I wouldn't be surprised if your device um, goes into implementation around the country, maybe even the world. <laughs> I hope so. And just one little tip. When you're using your plastic pipes and things, and even the tank, either paint it black or uh, something to stop the sunlight because you start to build up um, uh, nasty things growing in it. Probably not harmful, but it can block up pipes. So you don't want black pipes? You do want black pipes. You do want black pipes, yes. And the tank itself needs to be uh, shade in some way because it'll encourage algae growth in there. And the black will reflect the heat, preventing that. Well, it, uh, it, it will just stop this. No, it's just to stop the light getting into the water. Into oh, the okay. Water. Very simple. Yeah. All right, yeah. Frank, yeah. we got to go. Uh, yeah. But thank you very much. Right. This has been very informative. Uh, thank you for your show, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and explain that the stink bugs you're seeing in your home right now are not new invaders. They've been hibernating in your house since they snuck inside last fall. But don't go chasing them around the living room just yet, because we'll be right back with the proper way to plant your peas and more of your fabulous phone calls. I'm Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. J.L. Hudson Seeds has supported You Bet Your Garden and enthusiastic growers for more than 25 years. To learn more about the world's most eclectic seed company, visit jlhudsonseeds.net. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath, and coming up later in the show, you do want to stay tuned because we're going to tell you the secret to maximizing your harvest of snow peas, snap peas, English shelling peas, and whatever other kind of peas you want to grow, and you're going to get the most of them if you follow our advice, which is coming up after more of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. Nate, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being had, Nate. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good here in Shemokin, Pennsylvania. How are you? I'm just ducky, as always. <sighs> And we're taping this show during a pounding rainstorm, so Ducky wants to go out and play. Yeah, you might hear that on my end, too. Yeah. Ah, it's miserable. I can't wait for spring, and please let the weather be nice. So anyway. Yeah, we had thunder and lightning here last night. Yeah, me too. Uh, So what can we do you for? So I had kind of a convergence of circumstances. It all started with my cat eating my seedlings. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I decided I wanted to try other options and I came across the idea of a hotbed and I wanted to start it but I wanted to start it with um, maybe not uh, horse manure as I've heard some of the warnings about that and 
uh, we had this, those big storms come through a few weeks ago and it knocked down a bunch of trees, notably in my own yard, a lot of pine branches and mm-hmm. pine needles. And so I was thinking for the green material for the compost that's supposed to heat up for that hotbed, could I use that fresh green pine or like, would it just, destri- do I have to you know, like, um, grind it up with my lawnmower or something to the point that I don't, I don't think either is going to work. So tell me what kind of a quote hotbed you want to build. So the ones that I had seen were like maybe four by four by four. And you basically, they recommend you use horse manure and horse manure mixed with straw. It gets really hot. And then you put a layer of compost on top Mm -hmm. and then that creates heat from the bottom Mm -hmm. just as horse manure is known to do creates that heat and then that kind of acts like a heat heat mat and then you kind of build a little greenhouse over top of it basically just i have some old glass panel windows that i was going to put you know on a wooden frame that goes over the top and try to start seeds and they're still in seed trays or maybe in that compost uh but that's that's the idea at least but i was hoping to replace the horse manure with Maybe all this biomass that no. broke off all of those these trees. See, the thing about horse manure is that what's make that what's make that's what makes the hot bed hot. There's uh, pine needles are not going to heat up. Pine needles are actually a little difficult to use in the garden, and the wood is so fresh it's not going to do anything for you. Now, if you have branches down that have pine needles on them, green pine needles, and you're going to grow early season crops like lettuce and spinach, the best protection for them is to lay the pine boughs right down over top of them because, you know, they're, um, they're going to form like a little structure. They're going to be springy. They're going to be bouncy. Um, they'll help protect the lettuce and spinach from a last cold snap. Um, there's n- nothing better to do with them. I tell people at uh, in the fall that if they plant pansies that will survive the winter and come back in the spring, the best winter mulch is, quote, pine boughs. So that's the best use for that. Now, I congratulate you. Because you described a hotbed perfectly. You're exactly right. You dig out um, an area. You layer it with fresh horse manure. You want it to be stinky and steaming. And then, you, as you said correctly, you put compost over top of it so that the decaying horse manure is warming the compost uh, but not broiling your starts. And then whatever you can do to keep that heat inside the structure is a bonus. But this goes back to the times of Washington and Jefferson, who would often heat their greenhouses rather than build hotbeds, although they did that too. They would heat their greenhouses by leaving the center open, and then they would get their people to shovel fresh horse manure into the center of that greenhouse, and that would heat it up and keep it warm over the winter. Get out. No, no. Um, there's, there's even a name. Well, the, the names associated with these greenhouses were what was being protected, like orangeariums, things like that. Uh, but it was, uh, and, and, they, and they didn't have eating mats, you know. <laughs> Ben Franklin <laughs> hadn't given them the gift of electricity yet. So, yeah, that's exactly what they did. It's entirely natural. And because you have this horse manure cooking underneath the compost, as long as you don't disturb it, you shouldn't be bothered by any weed seeds or other negative things from using the manure. Okay. And for the horse manure, uh, I think I might have heard you say something about the risks of using it in the garden. So I was thinking, should I just, at the end of the season, once it's fully broken down, just spread it on my lawn instead, or is it okay to go in the garden? I would leave it in the garden because at that point, it's going to have lost a lot of its heat. 
um, and it's breaking down into good fertilizer. And all you should do after that is, um, you know, make sure there's another inch of compost on top of that bed. Now, if you have to empty it out and build it all over again, I would suggest using a different bed. God didn't put us here to work hard. (laughs) Yeah, maybe I just need to find a way to protect the starts from my cats. I don't know. Well, smarter than I am. Well, you know, there are some people have their starts behind chicken wire and Mm. some people are out there with water pistols. Yeah, well, with all the evil squirrels I have here, um, maybe outside, not the best idea either. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, that's it, man. You're right. Good luck to you. All right. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. I've been a big fan ever since I was a delivery guy in, at Penn State. Oh, thank you. Ago. Yeah, WPSU. <laughs> we get a lot of um, calls and emails and references from them. That's a huge audience for us. Yep. They turned me into a lifelong listener. There you go. Thank you. Thank them. Thank everybody. Thank the Academy. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thanks, Ducky. All right. You take care, man. You too. Bye-bye. Hello, cats and kittens. It's your audio editor, the lovely Jazzy Jonas Bone. Well, I've done it this time. I completely forgot to put the farm show call in. But now we have it here, the long-lost Harrisburg farm show call. Too late to matter, but good enough for rock and roll. Unfortunately, during the wintertime, this call did not make it into the show. But we thought we'd bring it to you here for posterity. Johnny Five, stay alive. 888-492-9444. Douglas, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Uh, hi, Mike. How, how are you? I am just ducky. Thank you for asking, Doug. I'm sure you're just ducky because you contact me every year trying to get me to make a announcement, promote uh, the Pennsylvania Farm Show in Harrisburg. Now, in past years, you've emailed me a week after the show closes. So this is the first time you remembered to get it together before it opens. So congratulations. That Prevagen must be working for you. Well, Mike, it's a nice event uh, for not just farmers, but for every uh, gardener that listens and watches your show. It's a, a place you can get ideas for your vegetable garden or your fruit trees. It's um, it's shockingly unbelievable. Uh, it It's in Harrisburg, and it's all indoors. Even on the cold days, it's a giant facility. Um uh, inside in Harrisburg. All right. We'll we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um what when does it begin and how many days does it run? It starts on the I think Saturday the 6th of January if I have my Saturdays in January and it goes for that full week closing the next Saturday. And you, you every aspect of agriculture in Pennsylvania uh, is is discussed or shown from from rodeos to alpacas to apples and grapes. When you emailed me about this event uh, this year, uh, maybe next year or last year, by the time we uh, air this show, I'm I'm lost in the multiverse. Uh, you also <laughs> wanted to discuss a phenomenon that seems to have become a yearly event in cold climates. Uh, would you expound on that? Uh, yes, Mike. Uh, recently, uh, I have a very old lilac bush. It, it, it must have been planted when the house was built. It shows like in the, from the 40s. And it comes back every year beautifully, uh, you know, purple. And But I've noticed in the last two years in – in December, it's starting to bloom, and I thought it was odd. And but then I was traveling to relatives out in Chester County. I, I live in Delaware County, and and their lilacs were blooming. So it wasn't just mine, but I don't know what would attribute to um, these lilacs blooming twice a year. Uh, climate change, climate change, and climate change. Um, my lilac 
has kind of behaved itself in the off season. But I wandered outside just looking around at things um, uh, probably early December and noticed that my forsythia were in bloom. And I've been getting uh, calls and emails from people whose um, apple blossoms are appearing, um, ornamental cherry trees in bloom. Um, all, all bets are off. We may have even affected the Earth's magnetic field, which controls a lot of these uh, happenings. The good thing is this is the third year in a row that my forsythia has done this trick, and it still blooms again in spring, which I had bet against, but luckily I was wrong. You know, I thought these things, they put their buds on in the summer, they got one shot, they blow it in the fall or winter, and then it'd be a barren spring. But no, um, for whatever reason, whatever is affecting these plants and disturbing their natural rhythms, it seems like it does not affect the spring bloom, um, which thankfully, um, would be the loss of something we all desperately need at the end of winter. I don't know about you, but when I see the daffodils come up and my crab apple trees start to bloom, it's like Prozac after us enduring this horrible winter. Yeah. It's a good thing. And, and, and I, I second that, Mike, uh, my lock is the second year they've done it. And I did not lose any blooms. Uh, it's almost, uh, knock on wood, a, 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 a twofer. I'm getting two for one. I'm getting two blooms a season. Exactly. But there there may be a price for this coming up. Keep, yeah, your, yeah. keep your wallet handy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I want to add that this will not happen with spring bulbs. Spring bulbs have a very different and finite uh, blooming time. So if you planted them correctly at the right time of year, they're going to come up when they're supposed to. And as to the other shrubs and trees and stuff, the best thing a gardener can do, and I try to repeat this every show, is nothing. You can't change this. You can't fix it. You can only harm it. I know we all desperately want to go out and help our plants, but um, they don't need our help. They need us to go on long vacations and leave them alone. So don't prune, don't I feed, agree. don't do anything over winter. All right, now I'm going to give I you a couple. The advice. I'm going to give you a couple more minutes uh, for the farm show in Harrisburg. The dates once again. Um, the dates are the. 6th You're supposed of... to keep that stuff out in front of you. <laughs> uh, January fifth uh, is when they do all the judging, so that's not open to the public. But it starts on the sixth. And it goes through the 13th, closing at 5 o'clock on Saturday the 13th. Now, I understand that this is a farm show. Um, and then a lot of people are there to be entering pies and apples. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be a, a gigantic life-size butter sculpture of somebody chopping wood or something. Um, but are there going to be instructional uh, events on, like, how to make compost, how to build a raised bed, um, how to use your water correctly? I, I don't know it, it, the specifics of those things, but all the county extension agents will be there. Okay. So you go to your extension officer, and you should be able to ask those questions well you raise a good point um this would be a great time to simply meet the staff at your county extension office um and yes. see what they offer see how they can help you um <laughs> unfortunately you can't take any 
uh, fertilizer or pesticide recommendations from them. But they can perhaps help you get into a composting workshop where you get a free or discounted uh, composter. They can tell you about other subsidies that may be available. Um, they may even be able to help you realize that starting a small farm is not for the timid. So I, I think you just you just nailed it. I would go there just to meet the extension agents in my county and my adjoining counties. I can walk to three different counties within five miles. Right. So I can see how it would work out. So, Douglas, thank you. Uh, it is the Pennsylvania Farm Show in our capital city of Harrisburg. And we'll put the dates up at the events section of our website. All right? Okay. You take care, man. Uh, you too. Bye, Mike. Bye-bye. <laughs> Well, it's time for me to take another little break and suggest that people who are suddenly coming across hibernating stink bugs waking up inside their house use a handheld vac or a canister vacuum to suck them up instead of making a stinky mess by squishing them. But don't go drowning your stinkers in a bucket of soapy water just yet because we'll be right back with important information about pea planting and more of your fabulous phone calls. I'm Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. This is 91.3 FM, WLVR Bethlehem, WLVR.org. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. I am your host, Mike McGrath, and we are in the stretch now, cats and kittens. In just a little bit, I'll be telling you the secrets of harvesting the maximum number of peas this spring. Because if you've grown them before, you know they don't make it through summer, so we got to get the most we can in June. And the secrets to doing so are coming up right after a couple more of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. 888-492-9444. Bob, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Hey, how you doing, Mike? I am just ducky, thanks for asking. How is Bob? Well, it is kind of ducky weather today with all this rain. But, hey, I got this, uh, this, this thing that keeps coming up. And you've talked about it before. I just want you to outline it again. People constantly want to cut back or trim things in the fall. And I say, hey, that's not a good time. You, should, you need to do it in the spring. And they say, who says that? I said, well, Mike McGrath. And they, you know, half of them don't know who you are, but it's everywhere. And I spent a lot of time in the Lehigh Valley area where there's, you know, a lot of people with uh, have those um, trailers, you know, with the back gate and they want to, you know, fill them up with stuff and take them to the nearest dump. And, and uh, unfortunately I have a place in, in Philadelphia where I don't have to ha handle all that stuff. But whenever I get in these conversations with people when I'm outside the city, I'm like, no, that's not the time to do it. You do it in the spring. All fall pruning is the result of boredom and impatience. Um, they don't really think there's any good reason to do it. But unlike the other seasons, it's still nice out. It's still warm. We're going to lose this wonderful weather. So let's look around for some plants we can kill. And that's what happens when you prune in the fall. Pruning stimulates growth. And that growth in the fall, depending on, you know, the time of the fall it is, um, it'll, go, it'll start to grow. It'll be stimulated. And then we could get a cold snap. And all the sap that's running, all of the material the plant is trying to grow gets frozen solid. And at the very least, it can really stress a tree. And at the worst, it can kill it. Plus, they have to think about what they're pruning. 
is this a spring blooming plant? You know, like azaleas and rhododendrons and plants like that. If it is, then they're cutting off the flower buds for the following year. These spring bloomers will not bloom. You took off the flower buds that were set uh, going into winter. So it can't help, but it can hurt. Now, um, I think in your email to us, you mentioned uh, dead branches. Right. So the rule with this is an easy one. Anytime there's a truly dead branch that hasn't leafed out, you should remove that as soon as you can get to it because it's stressing the tree. It's not helping the tree. It's taking energy from the tree. And it looks like Hades. I mean, you don't want these dead branches <laughs> hanging on your tree, right? Right. So I guess the differentiation and the thing we could come together with when I talk with these people is, yeah, you know, there's some branches you want to take off, and they're the ones that are clearly dead. But if they're not clearly dead, um, that's that's the, like the gray area, you know? Yeah, leave them alone. If, mm-hmm. however, uh, these people think that the tree is crowded, the canopy is over full, they need to prune to get some airflow in there, that's a different story. That is pruning in the dead of winter when the tree is yes. totally dormant. Then We've you had can... those discussions, too. Yes. Pardon? We've had those discussions, too, regarding apple trees and allowing enough airflow for the apple in the spring. Ah, but apple trees are spring bloomers. Right. So you have to realize um, that if you're doing that, you're going to miss out on flowers and apples. The better time to do that kind of pruning is in the spring, right after the blossoms fade. Um, And then you can choose which limbs you're going to remove knowing that you won't get apples off that, but you also now have an idea, a better idea of what it looks like, and you can make a better choice. So really spring, um, for non-spring blooming plants, spring is a great time to open up the center, to do um, horticulturally sound pruning, um, Nothing should be pruned in the summer because it presents the tree with an amazing amount of stress. And then in the fall, nothing should be pruned because you're going to encourage the tree to resume growing at the worst time. So dead limbs any time of year, live limbs on non-spring bloomers uh, that need to be removed to open up the airflow on the tree, that can be done in the dead of winter and non-spring bloomers in the spring. But if you've got spring bloomers that are overcrowded, and especially if they're not fruiting like apple trees, once the flowers fade, that's the perfect time to prune plants like azaleas and rhododendrons right after the flowers fade and things like ornamental cherry trees um, because, you know, no fruit is going to form. And this is the right way to keep the plant under control for size and shape. And you do no harm. Great. So just to reiterate, there's no pruning in the fall unless you're getting rid of a dead branch. (laughs) Correct. Exactly right. Stay, stay tuned to the football game. Watch the football game or do something else. Exactly <laughs> right. That's why I say in the fall, watch the World Series. You know, don't look out in your garden. You know, mm-hmm. get involved in a in a streaming service that's going to take the next 12 weeks away from you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mike. My pleasure. You take care, Bob. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And now, as always, as promised, as is inevitable, it's time for the question of the week, which we're calling how to start peas and beans indoors. Janine writes, we live in Washington State. What would be the best time to start planting snap pea and green bean seeds indoors 
to transplant them outside later? And what is the best method to start those seeds? Well, Janine, to quote the all-knowing Internet, Washington State growing zones are wide-ranging and can be anywhere from a frosty 4A to an almost tropical 9A. Although much of the state, the eastern half, falls into the range of 6A, like my garden. Luckily, we don't need to know Janine's exact location with these crops because we're going to give you the information for all types of climates. Both peas and beans are, quote, direct sown crops, meaning that most people plant the seeds right in the ground as opposed to starting them inside like tomatoes and peppers. They are also both legumes, which means that if their roots come into contact with the right types of soil bacteria, they gain the ability to feed themselves with nitrogen from the air, which is wicked cool. You can buy the correct bacteria, called a pea and bean inoculant, in powdered form at your friendly neighborhood garden center or direct from gurneys. Peas are a cool weather springtime crop and beans are a warm weather crop of the summer, just like them tomatoes and peppers we just mentioned. Virtually all varieties of pea, snap peas, sugar peas, shelling peas, snow peas, have an average days to maturity rating of 60 days, which means that if you start them mid-March, like now, they'll have all of April and May to grow, with you getting all of June to pick and enjoy the crop before it burns up in the summer heat. Their inability to take care of themselves in summer heat is why they're called June peas. Here in the East, many gardeners believe that planting peas on St. Patrick's Day is good luck, which it is not if there's still snow and or frozen soil in your garden. St. Patrick's Day falls on March 17th this year, and if you can plant around that date, you might start picking your first peas in late May if you cheat, and here's how to cheat. Select the bed in which you will plant your pea seeds. Remove any mulch covering the surface of the soil to allow it to warm up faster. Then do not start your pea seeds indoors the tomato and pepper way. Instead, pre-sprout them. About a week after you start warming that soil, take your pea seeds, which are big and really easy to handle, and put them into Ziploc bags with enough moist paper towels to cover all the seeds. Now, do not zip those bags shut. Just fold them over and place them out in the open in a warm room where you can see them every day. Check those seeds daily. If there's no sign of moisture on the inside of the bags, add a little water, or even better, use a mister. After five to seven days, you should see little white squigglies coming out of some of those seeds. Leave the bag wide open now to prevent mold, but keep misting the insides gently. Then, when most of the seeds have nice-sized squigglies and the soil outside is workable, as in not frozen, plant your pre-spouted seeds. If you have the inoculant at hand, dust it into the planting holes or rows right with the seeds. Although the seeds would probably have rotted in the cold, wet soil of spring, the sprouted seeds and the plants that follow don't mind cool weather. In fact, they require it. Now, some varieties will have the word bush associated with their names. This means that the vines will top out at around two to three foot tall and require minimal support. But if they don't say bush, they will need to be trellised or they will collapse into an ungodly mess. Check the packet, seed catalog, or website description for the final height of your specific variety 
and respect it. When the first pea pods appear, pick them as soon as they achieve a decent size. You eat snow peas and snap peas, pod and all. So pick snow peas at any size. If you can see them, you can eat them. Pick snap peas a little larger, but don't let the seeds inside get too big. The smallest pods taste the best. And not allowing the seeds to get too big inside the pods means the plants will keep producing prodigiously. You like that? English or shelling peas are a little different. With this type, you just eat the actual peas inside. So when the pods begin to swell, sample them daily. Zip off the handy string that's running down the size of the pods and savor the peas inside. When they get to be the size of the ones that Jolly Green Giant puts in those famous Lesseur cans, begin seriously harvesting one of springtime's tastiest treats. Steamed peas and onions. Steamed peas served with garlic butter. Ah, it's great. When the vines start to shrivel and die, pick what's left and clear that bed for a new crop, like beans, which aren't going to need no pre-sprouting because the soil is now nice and warm. The beans will be designated as, quote, bush, which means well-behaved, or, quote, pole, which means it requires a sturdy trellis. Again, respect the final height of your specific variety. Beans will persist until frost, as should you. Self-supporting note. Even dwarf-sized peas that top out at two or three feet tall would love some thin sticks to climb on. Warning, warning, warning. Regular peas grow really tall, so don't skip on the height of their trellis. Well, that sure was a nice set of helpful hints to help you enjoy a robust harvest of spring peas, now, wasn't it? Luckily, you can read these vital instructions over at your leisure or your leisure at the Gurney's website. That's G-U-R-N-E-Y-S. Just visit that site and click on Garden Resources or type Gurney's plus You Bet Your Garden into your favorite search engine. Yikes, my producer is threatening to poach my peas. If I don't get out of this studio, we must be out of time. But you can call us anytime at 888-492-9444 or send us your email, you're tired, you're poor, your wretched refuse of a question, teeming to our garden shores at mikemcg at ptd.net. That's Mike, M-C-G, at PeterThomasDavid.net. Please include your phone number and your location. All right, please? I said it nice. I said please. I'll also say thank you when you do it. You'll find all of our updated contact information, plus audio of this show, audio and video of previous shows, and links to our internationally renowned podcast, It's all at our website, youbetyourgarden.org. You Bet Your Garden is a public radio show and podcast produced and delivered to you every week from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created when Bobby Schaefer's family bought the first color TV on the block and the rest of us wore out their furniture. They are now transmitting a black and white picture. By pressing this button, which I now do, the cameras are transmitting a live color picture. When you step before them, you will be making your first appearance on color television from Washington. 3,000 miles away in our studios in Burbank, California, this entire program is being recorded on electronic tape. The picture, the color, the sound are being captured for posterity through this recording system which NBC began using on a full-scale basis only last month the change to daylight time. It will permit us, sir,
to retelecast this program to many sections of the United States several hours later today, and with such true fidelity that millions of Americans will see this ceremony as though it were being enacted at that time. Our musical director is Ken Queter. Our chief content officer is Yoni Greenbaum. Our angel of the airways is Christine Dempsey. And our engineer is the always cheerful Charlie Sarah. Our social media director is Amanda Norfleet. Check out her fine work and keep track of our updated contact information at the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page. And while you're there, take a look at the pictures of my new sideways rhododendron and tell us if you think it's going to bloom this year or not. Our peerless princess of profound production is Jasmine Griffin. Our irreplaceable audio editor is the lovely Jonas Bowen. Johnny Five, stay alive. Our croupier is Tim Fowler. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, and I'll be busy sowing more lettuce seed, watching my Italian stallion scallions grow. That's a real type and staring at my newly started tomatoes until their seeds begin to sprout. And then I can see you again next week.